darkmyths.org and the Opus Media Group proudly present to you the Lone Gunman Podcast, featuring your host, Rob Clark, where research comes to shine and myths come to die. Stay tuned. Be right there. What's up, everybody, and welcome to episode 158 of the Lone Gummin Podcast. I am your host, Rob Clark, with you here today. And on this episode, we are going to be going back to New Orleans, back to the summer of 63, and dig a little deeper about what was going on with Lee Harvey Oswald and a few other interesting subjects that we're going to be talking about here. Now, one big contention of this case has always been the FBI. Was Oswald an FBI informant? Was he just working for Guy Bannister who was reporting to the FBI? Was Guy Bannister lying to Lee Harvey Oswald saying that Uh, They were doing this work for the FBI when they really weren't. Um, Was the CIA involved? Were any other intelligence agencies involved? You know, because Oswald had a very specific uh, qualities that one would look for if you were looking to set someone up. Uh, to take the fall for something in the future uh, perfectly in a case like the assassination of JFK. But I promise we'll get there. What I want to talk to you guys today about is a little bit about the FBI, um, what they were doing uh, with Oswald in 1963. Warren Debris specifically, and also I want to get into the testimony of Orestes Pena, who was a bar owner in New Orleans, and his HSCA testimony is very uh, eye-opening, if you believe it all. We're going to get into it today and see if we can parse the wheat from the chafe. So... You know, this is fairly recent out of the new documents. Uh, I think a couple years ago, uh, it was kind of a big to-do, this HSCA testimony of Arrestes Pena and what he claims. Um, and, you know, we'll talk about both sides of it, as we usually do here. Um, but before we do, let me just say a couple things. Um If you did not hear yet, I have opened up a different podcast called The Lone Gunman from the Vault. Now, from the Vault, there's a lot of shows that I have guest hosted on. There are shows that I've been a guest on in the past. There are JFK-related shows that I think are important and should be heard and decided that I wanted to give them another platform to be heard on. So please find it on iTunes, Google Play, uh, wherever you listen to podcasts, make sure you subscribe to The Lone Gunman from The Vault because I will be regularly uploading classic shows. I just threw up uh, a bunch of shows uh, from where I was on Doug's podcast, The Dallas Action. I think I put four of them up. Um, before that, there's there's classic radio shows from Mae Russell, uh, Jerry Pippen, 
uh, all kinds of cool stuff that you might not have heard before that uh, should be given a listen. So check it out, like, and subscribe, and uh, keep doing the same for the regular Lone Gunman channel. And be sure you're on the lookout for me and Doug's show, Quick Hits, a news and notes podcast on the assassination. Find that and subscribe and like as well. Um, I will be leaving for Dallas here in a couple days, and I can't wait. Uh, I've been talking to some people, Facebook friends, and uh, hopefully get to meet up with a bunch of guys and gals. Uh, down there in Dallas, and just do the damn thing. Do the tour. I got my I got my tickets for the Sixth Floor Museum. I'll be going to the Kappa Conference on Saturday, and the banquet with Oliver Stone. And I have a meeting with uh, one Mr. John Newman already set up for, to do a, a interview for for me and Doug Show Quick Hits. So be looking for that stuff in the future. So make sure you subscribe and like the podcast wherever you listen to the shows follow me on social media at the lone gunman seven on twitter and on facebook and uh that'll keep you in touch if you're gonna be in dallas and you want to holler at me that's how to do it send me an email or hit me up on twitter and we'll make it happen we'll hang out in dallas and uh talk some shop so let's get into the show tonight and uh also real quick before we start the show tonight, you know, uh, I I love Bart, and every time he's on the show, I always seem to get into arguments with people in in these groups and online, and uh, they don't seem to understand the importance of documentation and versus the established story that we've been told. Um, by the Warren Commission. And the crux of the matter is, folks, in his very first interrogation by Will Fritz and book out and hostie of the FBI, now that we have, and we've had for a few years, Fritz's handwritten notes, which were, of course, written a couple of days later, we also have hostie's uh, handwritten notes that were taken as they interrogated Oswald. And it very clearly states in there that he went outside to watch the presidential parade. And in Fritz's notes, it says he was out front with Bill Shelley. Now, why is this important? Because that was his alibi, folks. That was his alibi at the time of the shots. And this whole narrative that we've been fed all these years trying to figure out where Oswald was at 12.31 p.m. on November 22nd, 1963. It's been there the whole time. They denied us the truth. They denied us his own spoken alibi. And more than likely, Oswald, as one does, with a beverage, you have a beverage with your lunch. You don't eat your lunch and then go get a beverage to just wash it all down. Most of the time, you know, if you're a normal person, you have a you have something to drink while you're eating to help wash down your food as you eat. Therefore, it's highly likely that And it says in Hostie's notes, folks, that Oswald stated he went upstairs to get a coat and then came down back downstairs to eat his lunch. Okay? That's exactly how he said it. Okay, so this whole second floor lunchroom encounter fabricated to put Oswald closer to the sixth floor, yet nobody saw Oswald on the stairs. Not Victoria Adams, not Sandra Stiles, nobody else who, after the shots, decided to come downstairs and see what was going on. Nobody going up the stairs saw him on the stairs, and nobody coming down the stairs saw him on the stairs. He just magically appears in the second floor lunchroom, just standing there drinking a Coke. When in all actuality, the encounter, in quotes, 
more than likely happened on the first floor. That is to say, Oswald likely got his lunch or got a Coke, came downstairs, and ate his lunch in the domino room on the first floor. And the encounter happened not too long after Truly and Baker went inside the glass doors in the vestibule before they even got near the elevators or near the stairs. Now, it's not out of the realm of possibility for Prayer Man to be Oswald. Okay, so he gets done his lunch. He decides to step outside. He steps outside. He's a quiet guy. He's not going to fight his way through all these people just to get down to the street to get a better view. He's already up on the top of the stairs. He can see just fine. Everybody else is focused on the presidential motorcade that's heading towards them. Coming, coming down the street and turning on to Elm Street. Coming down Houston, turning on to Elm. It's not out of the realm of possibility that Oswald could have slipped outside behind everybody unnoticed. And when the shots rang out and Kennedy is killed, he realizes at that moment that the gig is up, that he's been set up. And yeah, he's one of the first ones to leave. He goes back inside, he slips back inside, figures out what he's going to do real quick, and he gets the hell out of there. And it's quite not quite out of the realm of possibility that he could have done it unseen. And also this whole thing about prayer man being a woman. Uh, you know, it's, it's funny how these guys attack people who say that prayer man is Lee Oswald because oh, we, you can't say that because you know, you're basing that on a fuzzy picture. You can't really see the details of anything. Can't say that's Oswald. Yet, you know, people want to bring up this image where they say it's a woman because it, it has the person has long hair and a purse and, and all this other nonsense. And you can't see that either. It's a fuzzy picture, folks. What, it, what you have to do by process of elimination is use a little logic and do some research. Once you figure out who everybody was supposed to be, and you know it's been established, we know just about who everybody was lining the streets of Elm Street. We know just about who everybody was that was out there on the front steps of the school book depository. We know who was watching the parade from different floors, and who was inside, and this, that, and the other. And we, by process of elimination, you can say that that person definitely worked in the building. I mean, who as a passerby would want to cut their way up through all these people that are standing on the steps that work in this building just to go up to the top step to stand back in the corner? It makes no sense. What does make sense, however, is that Oswald would have been interested in what was going on and he would have slipped outside unnoticed behind everybody as their attention is focused on the motorcade then everybody's attention is focused on the shots that are ringing out, the president being shot, and all hell breaking loose. And in that pandemonium, Oswald slips back inside, and, you know, it goes from there. Um, and that's all I want to say about that. And uh, all I'm saying is just, you know, give it a little thought. Use a little common sense. Use a little logic. and. Uh, you know, realize that you've been told a fairy tale for the past 56 years. And that the truth is that Oswald said he was out front watching the parade. That was his alibi. They didn't give him his alibi. They didn't give him a lawyer. He was repeatedly denied representation. That's why he asked for it several times there. They kept going over and over the same thing. He didn't even know what he was being charged with, what was going on. They were shuffling him around, denying him representation. So don't believe the hype, all right? The Dallas PD and, and district attorney were stalling for the FBI, for Hoover. They had sent the evidence down there, away to them. They were stalling for instructions on what to do with this guy. They were stalling because they had to figure out who this guy was. They were stalling. I mean, they had him for the murder of Tippett, but that's all they charged him with initially. You know, 
we get that midnight press conference and the, and the, uh, the Oswald face when he's told that he's been charged with murdering the president. So, and what they did to Oswald is a perfect setup for the perfect Patsy. And we're going to get into tonight a little bit more about how um, he was used in that capacity. Now, when we're talking about Orestes Pena, okay, he was he was an anti-Castro Cuban. He was a bar owner in New Orleans, and he was also an informant for the FBI. And his handler was a fellow by the name of Warren DeBreeze. Now, there was also a guy you may have heard of named Sergio Arcacha Smith. He was the front man for the Cuban Revolutionary Front. And Pena tells us that Warren DeBreeze used to go a lot to the office to talk to Sergio Arcacha Smith. Another person that used to go there a lot was William Ferry. William David Ferry, which Mr. DeBreeze knew very well. And Mr. Ferry used to take Mr. Smith in his car almost every day to his house after the office was closed. They asked him, do you know whether Warren DeBreeze ever attended any meetings of the Cuban Revolutionary Front? He says he was very frequently in the office talking in private with Mr. Sergio Arcasha Smith. Um, so there's a couple names that pop up right off the bat to make your ears prick up. Sergio Arcasha Smith and David Ferry. Um, they asked him, were you ever paid for any of the information that you provided to the FBI? And Pena says, I was never paid a single penny. Plus, the FBI brought me a lot of Cubans that were stowaways. They brought them to me at my place of business and told me to give them room and board and find them a job. Some of those people still live here in New Orleans, which I can give you the names and prove it was true that the FBI and immigration brought them to me to help them, and they would pay for whatever had to be done. I never gave them a bill because I thought that was doing something good for the United States and something good for the cause of drawing Castro away from Cuba. They asked him, I believe you stated earlier that you gave your information to FBI Special Agent Warren DeBreeze. Did you ever provide any information to other FBI agents before the assassination of Kennedy? He says, Warren DeBreeze was the FBI agent that was assigned to me. He gave me the phone, and every time I called to the FBI office, I asked for Warren DeBreeze. I said I was told to ask for him, that he would be the one to take care of whatever I had to tell the FBI. He was the one that used to come to my place of business. He was the one I dealt with. So, we have Warren DeBreeze in New Orleans, running informants deep in the anti-Castro movement. Um, so, as we go on through here, they ask him, did you ever meet with Mr. DeBreeze in any other location besides your place of business? He says, yes, I met with him at the FBI office, and I saw him and talked a little bit at the Cuban Revolutionary Front office. At the Balter building was the name of the building where the office was on Camp Street. All the way to St. Charles was a building with an alley in the front. The building had three or four different entrances. So I saw him and I talked to him at the offices of the CRF, which Arkasha was there among other members. Now this is the same building, folks, where the offices of Guy Bannister were as well. And the, the address... 544 Camp Street that Oswald stamped on his FPCC flyers. So, now as we're going on here, they ask him, did he ever work for any other government agency? He says, yes, I did for another United States agency. What was that agency? He says, I will not tell you. <laughs> they ask him, what is your reason for keeping the name of the agency secret? My reason is, if I cannot prove the truth of what happened with Warren DeBreeze, which to me is the most important person in the Kennedy assassination, why should I give any other allegations? If I cannot prove something that I worked for the man, 
that I reported to the man, if I cannot prove these things, why should I put something else? Are you saying that if you can prove certain allegations concerning Warren DeBreeze, you would then reveal a relationship with another government agency? I do it this way for the United States. I give all my constitutional rights. I would get a lie test, whatever the government thinks is right. Uh, if you ask me if I work with the FBI, Warren DeBries told me before, about a week or 10 days or less before I went to testify to the Warren Commission, that if I talk about him, he will get rid of my ass. <laughs> okay. So, uh, then Pena says, you can ask me if I was ever an informant for any other agency in the world, but two agencies in the United States. One was the FBI and one more. Then if I'm right, the government will have to force Warren to breathe to take the same test I take. Then they asked, uh, Mr. Pena, do you have any information as to whether Lee Harvey Oswald was ever an FBI informant? I mean, they get right to it here. Oswald used to go to a restaurant on the corner of Decatur and Iberville. The name of the owner was Mr. Pedro, a Greek. And Mr. Oswald used to go to the restaurant in the morning with other federal agents from the Customs House building. Now, folks, the Customs House building was where the FBI was headquarters, the CIA was headquartered, the ONI was headquartered. This is where all the government intelligence agencies were headquartered in New Orleans. You know, the immigration, the INS, whatever, Customs. Now, to prove I was there, that I saw Oswald, that I saw all these agents drinking coffee, having breakfast in the restaurant in the morning, I will name, I have more than one, but I will name one right now, Mr. Victor Perez, who lived in Altoona, Florida, zip code 32702. This man was a bar operator in the 200 block of Decatur, and we used to go in the morning and talk about business, and he was watching and looking at all the federal agents, which we knew very well because many of these federal agents speak Spanish, and others was married to some Spanish women that I know. And they asked him well, who specifically was with Oswald on these occasions. I cannot say such and such a person was with him or talking to him, but I knew the face. I knew the face of a lot of other agents from the Customs House building that go to the restaurant there, and I saw them together having breakfast together at the restaurant. Did you ever see Oswald in the presence of Warren DeBreeze? They asked him. He says, I better don't answer this question right now. They say, my question, Mr. Pena, is whether you ever saw Lee Harvey Oswald at any restaurant or any other location with Warren DeBreeze. He says, yes, I will testify that Warren DeBreeze being at the Pedro, the Greek restaurant on Decatur and Iberville, at the same time Oswald was at the restaurant in the company of other federal agents. Do you know the name of that restaurant? He says, I do not know the name of that restaurant. The owner was a Mr. Pedro, and we used to call him Pedro the Greek. Do you ever observe Oswald and DeBree speaking to each other? He says, I cannot answer that question. If I cannot prove myself what DeBree did to me, how am I going to prove other things? They say, my question, Mr. Pena, do you ever recall seeing Oswald and DeBree speaking together or acting in such a way what you would think that they knew each other? Answer, I believe they knew each other very, very well. Can you explain why you believe Oswald and DeBreeze knew each other very well? He says, my belief, I would have to report in as, a, as informant to Mr. DeBreeze. I have to report myself to Mr. DeBreeze, and that is my point of view on that question. When Oswald was transferred to Dallas, Mr. DeBreeze was transferred to Dallas at the same time. Now, I've heard that before. It's very interesting. Very, very interesting. Uh, that DeBreeze would be transferred to Dallas at this, around the same time as Oswald is transferred to Dallas. Now, he says, uh, they ask him, does he, does he know when Oswald went to Dallas and when DeBreeze went to Dallas? He says, no, I do not know when Oswald went to Dallas, but I know when Warren DeBreeze went to Dallas because he came to my place of business and told me that I do not have to call him anymore at his office because he was transferred to Dallas. They asked, do you know whether DeBreeze was transferred to Dallas after the assassination? Pena says, I'm very sure, I'm very, very, very sure it was before the assassination. Then they ask him, are you aware that DeBreeze was in Dallas after the assassination to help with the FBI investigation of the assassination of President Kennedy? He says, I don't know anything about that. 
They ask him, is it your recollection then that DeBreeze left New Orleans and went to Dallas before the assassination? He says, yes, sir. Do you feel that the fact that DeBreeze went to Dallas had to do before the assassination of President Kennedy and before Oswald himself was killed? And they, he says, well, that's for you to find out. They ask him if he has an opinion on this. And Pena says, do you make any investigation about the camp to train Cubans to go fight Castro for the Bay of Pigs? There's Cubans was training in New Orleans under the command of the FBI and CIA. I can talk this way because I had three or four of my customers, people that used to live in my hotel or rooming house that went and took training there. They ask him, is there a connection between the training camp of Cubans in New Orleans and the assassination of President Kennedy? And he says, I am very sure. Yes, sir. They ask him, could he be more specific? And he says, yes. One of the men that was training was a cadre to train all the other Cubans. A very, very smart man. I believe he was a captain in the Cuban army during the Batista regime. His name was Juan Eladio Caballero, alias Leo Guajiro. This man right now, he did not die yet is in Texas State Prison, Huntsville, Texas, for killing somebody in Texas. This man is married to a lady in New Orleans that has a daughter, which I know very, very well. This man, several times before the death of President Kennedy, when he got drunk in my place of business, he was very mad at the president. A lot of, a lot of times, more than a dozen times, he said in Spanish that the only way to get rid of that son of a bitch, that means the president of the United States. He's got one more brother who was a high rank in the Cuban army during the Batista regime, and he was a cadre in the training camp the CIA got here. And he got a cousin that looks similar to Oswald. I cannot remember the name of the cousin or the brother, but Juan Eladio Caballero will tell you. If you go to the state prison in Huntsville and ask Juan Caballero who was his cousin and his brother, then we are going to start something about the death of President Kennedy. And they ask him, Mr. Payne, let's return to the questions involving the contacts which you saw Oswald had with Warren DeBreeze. Can you explain any reasons which he might have which led to you to believe that Oswald was DeBreeze's informant? This is where Payne starts to get antsy in his seat, folks. He says, I better not say anything else. More or less, I told you I knew Oswald. When Oswald was giving propaganda in favor of Cuba at the old international trademark, I was there. I will get into Oswald's activities in New Orleans just a little bit later, but can you offer any other reasons which have led you to believe Oswald was an FBI informant? The answer, I cannot go back. He would have to bring, we would have to bring Mr. Carlos Brignier because Oswald went to Carlos and tried to fight in favor of the Cubans. So we would have to come back to the same thing Excuse me, and that doesn't matter. And then they ask him, do you want to add anything concerning Oswald's coming to see Carlos Brignier and offering his services to Carlos to train anti-Castro Cubans? He says, between Carlos and Oswald, the only thing else I want to talk about is the fight they got into on Canal Street. They ask him, do you have any specific reasons which have led you to believe Oswald was an FBI informant? For instance, did you ever see Oswald and DeBreeze entering the restaurant together or leaving the restaurant together? Pena says, I cannot say entering the restaurant, but I saw Oswald and DeBreez and Mr. David Smith and Mr. Rogue from the Immigration Department and other government agents leaving the restaurant and going to the Customs House building, which at that time was an office for different kinds of government agencies. They ask him, did Oswald ever accompany this group either when they entered or left the restaurant? Yes, he did. And I got Mr. Perez that I gave you the address on to prove it. Did Oswald act like he knew any of this group which came into the restaurant frequently? Answer, yes, they knew each other very, very well. Did you see him talking with members of this group? Yes, they was talking. I can't say who was talking to whom, but they was talking and they was in the same group. Did you ever see DeBreeze in particular talking with Lee Harvey Oswald? Answer, I just can't say that exactly. Now, they say, Mr. Pena, when did you first make the allegation that Oswald was an FBI informant? I don't remember exactly. He says, I went to the Warren Commission. I was subpoenaed to go to the Warren Commission, and I remember exactly that I went to accuse Warren DeBreeze because I believe that Warren DeBreeze, if he really wanted, could have saved the life of President Kennedy. Um, 
They ask him, do you recall making a public statement that Lee Harvey Oswald was an FBI informant around 1975? Answer, yes, I still believe that he was an informant. Do you recall making a statement on this issue on CBS television? Yes, CBS. Do you recall ever making this statement before that time publicly? I've talked to a lot of friends and a lot of people have been talking to me about the assassination of President Kennedy. And I talked a lot and I told them I believe he was an informer that he was an agent of the United States government. Are you saying that Oswald was an agent of the United States? And answer, in my belief, yes, sir. They ask him why he waited so long to make his allegations, and he says, well, I tell you, I did not wait very long. I went, when the Warren Commission subpoenaed me for the Warren Commission, I went, I tried to talk. I believe the person in charge was Mr. Liebler, and I told him I want to accuse Warren DeBreeze. So you can see from this story that I've been trying to accuse this FBI agent. At that time, I was having in mind to accuse him of these Spanish Cubans that was training in a camp in New Orleans. But when I saw Mr. Liebler did not cooperate with me and did not let me talk, I said I might as well keep my mouth shut. I don't accuse anybody else but Warren DeBreeze. Then they ask him, uh, did Warren DeBreeze intimidate you? And he says, yes, sir. And they ask him what way? And he says, in a few days, or a few days, I can't say one week or two or ten, but a few days before I went to testify to the Warren Commission, he came to my place of business at 117 Decatur and called me to the table and told me he wanted to talk to me. I went to him because I used to talk to him almost every three or four days. He told me that if I talk about anything about him, he will get rid of my ass. Why do you think he made this threat to you? He says, because of my belief, he knew I was going to accuse him at the Warren Commission testimony. He was trying to impress me not to do so, uh, which I went and accused him, or I was having in mind to accuse the Cubans that was training in New Orleans. When I saw what happened, how much they was covering it up, taking away, <clears throat> that I did not express myself about the breeze, so I changed my mind that I did not say anything about the Cubans or the training camp in New Orleans. They say, do you feel that Warren DeBreeze might have wanted to intimidate you to prevent you from saying that Oswald was an FBI informant? He says, yes, could be too. Again, I want to ask you why you waited so long before you publicly stated that you had reason to believe that Oswald was an FBI informant. Pena says, I wrote to Mr. Mark Lane. A letter came back one year or so later. I went to New York and I took the address of the editor of his book and I took some photostatic, some papers that I still have to him. I could not see him, but his editor or one of the persons that worked in New York City, I believe 6th Avenue, told me that he would see that Mr. Mark Lane got those papers. Mr. Harold Weisberg came to me trying to get some information. Weis Weisberg brought me some papers from the archives of the United States. Some of the papers he brought me from the archives was one of the informants of the FBI of the United States. The name of that person is Hector Jose Garcia. According to the archive file, Mr. Hector Jose Garcia said that I am supposed to talk one night directly to Mr. Castro in Cuba. I would like to offer myself again and to bring Mr. Hector Garcia and and Lot, both of us, take a lie test to see who is right and who is wrong, and then you will see what the FBI is, is doing trying to discourage me. The answer again, Mr. Pena, is there any substantiation for your allegation that Oswald was an FBI informant? Can you offer any other proof? And uh, Pena says, I will not talk any more else about it. This matter, it would be more to talk about this matter. We have come to something else. Who is Sergio Acacia Smith in the office in the Balter building? The offices of Sergio Acacia Smith and the FBI, when all this matter is straightened up, when we will talk about some other offices in the same Balter building. Well, what about some other offices in the same Balter building? It is another office in the Balter building. You better leave it like that, like it is. I do not want to go any further. Do you have anything else to offer on the allegation that Oswald was an FBI informant? Not right now. So, apparently, there were some other offices in the Balter building that we don't really know about. <laughs> Could it have been... An FBI office?
Could it have been Lee Harvey Oswald's secret office at the Balter building? Or some other thing that was going on? Now, they changed the, the flow of the conversation here a little bit since uh, Pena decides he wants to button up about this all this uh, FBI business. Um, so they say, I would like to ask you questions concerning Lee Harvey Oswald's activities in New Orleans. Did you have occasion to observe Oswald in New Orleans? He says, yes, I did, sir. Besides the restaurant activity, yes. Did you see him passing out fair play for Cuba pamphlets? Yes, sir. I saw in front of the old international trademark and the 100 block of Camp Street. I saw him fight with Mr. Carlos Brignier on Canal Street, which after the police got there and arrested both of them, Mr. Oswald and Mr. Brignier and took them to jail. I went to Mr. Carlos Brignier's place of business and I talked to his brother-in-law. His name is Commandant Pelac. 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 <clears throat> he was a big name in the Cuban army. Commandante Pelac, who is Mr. Brignier's brother-in-law. I told Mr. Pelac that Brignier was fighting with Oswald on Canal Street and the police took him to jail. Mr. Pelek told me he did not have anybody to leave the store, uh, closed store, novelty store, whatever you want to call it, for me to do him a favor and go to the police station and place the bond, <clears throat> which I went to the first precinct police station, and I asked the sergeant, which knew me very well, that I wanted to place a bond. And he says, yes, arrest. You just have to put $25. Well, I put $25 for Brignier's bond. I came back to Mr. Brignier's store, and Mr. Pellack gave me back my $25 that I had left at the police station. He says, why don't you ask the chief of police why he did not tell the Warren Commission Pena was the one that let Brignier out? That proves there that I knew Oswald very, very well. I was there. My bartender was there, too. His name was Evaristo Rodriguez. Now, it says, uh, they asked him, do you know whether any, whether any other FBI agents were present during the fight? He says, I do not know. I cannot say anything else. Do you know whether Oswald ever came to your bar, the Habana Bar in New Orleans? Yes, sir. Did you personally see him at your bar? Yes. He came one night with two or three more guests. They asked for something. One guy asked for tequila, I believe. Another asked for a drink, and he asked for a lemonade. The matter, which I never did forget, because in my place of business, we never did for many, many years sell lemonade. My bartender asked me, do we sell lemonade here in Spanish? My bartender and me, we talk in Spanish all the time. I said, yes, we sell lemonade. Get a glass of water, put two or three spoons of sugar and half a lemon, and put ice and charge 25 cents. According to the bartender, because I did not hear that, Mr. Rodriguez, Oswald started bitching about the price of the lemonade for 25 cents. He said I was a capitalist or something like that. So I told the bartender, take that second drink. He can go and drink it somewhere else. He had to pay for the first one. Did you personally see Oswald in your bar? Yes, I did personally see him in my bar. Can you identify the people that accompanied Oswald in your bar? No. Were they Cubans? He says they look Spanish. My bartender, Mr. Rodriguez, would answer the question much better because he came exactly to the table where those people were sitting. They asked him, do you recall whether any of the Spanish individuals spoke in a particular accent. No, I was not there. I was away from where they were sitting. Do you recall seeing Oswald in New Orleans at any other times? I told you already where I saw him. And they asked him, Do you recall applying for a passport in New Orleans on June 24th of 1963? Yes, sir. I'm referring now to Warren Commission Pena Exhibit Number 1. And he says, <clears throat> That's all right. Don't show it to me. I want you to put this down. The government said, I said that I took that passport at the Customs House building, and the government said that they did not issue me a passport in that building. I would like to find out who is right, the government or me. Did you know that Lee Harvey Oswald applied for a passport in New Orleans on the same day, June 24th, 1963? And he said, I was told so by Mr. Harold Weisberg. Question, do you remember seeing Lee Harvey Oswald on that day? No, I do not remember. I do not remember seeing him. Do you think if Oswald has been present at the same time applying for a passport that you would remember seeing him? Yes, sir. 
So they go on about this uh, passport, blah, 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 blah. And uh, they ask him, did you ever see Lee Harvey Oswald in Mexico? And he says, no. Did you ever go to Mexico or any other country or, or any intelli- on any intelligence mission? He says, no, sir. They say, did you ever work for the CIA? <laughs> Pena says, I will not answer any questions about the Central Intelligence Agency. Um, they say, okay, Mr. Pena, well, I would like to show you again the document labeled JFK Exhibit Number 94, which is a release letter from the CIA to the House Select Committee on Assassination. I would like you to explain, again, whether you would answer any questions concerning any relationship you might have had with the CIA. No, sir. Uh, then they ask, will you answer any questions concerning any possible relationship with the CIA at a future time? And he says, maybe if you investigate and get the real facts of the training camp that was run by the FBI and the CIA of the United States in New Orleans, the camp in New Orleans, maybe I will remember something else later on. And uh, they asked him about Sergio Arcata Smith, whether or not he was uh, connected with the assassination of President Kennedy. He says, I can't answer that question, but he was very close to DeBreeze, and he was very close to David Ferry. Did you know David Ferry? He says, yes, sir. He taught me how to fly Cessnas. When did he teach you how to fly, they ask. I can't remember exactly, but if you go to the lakefront airport and ask for my log, which if you need me to sign for it, I will sign it and get them to release it to you anytime you want to give you my log. It was signed there. Every time I went there with David William Ferry to fly, he signed the log. Those papers have to be there somewhere. You have my permission to get it. and You will know exactly the day I started taking lessons and every day I fly sessions with David Ferry. They ask him, do you know whether Sergio Arcacha Smith or David Ferry knew Lee Harvey Oswald? He said, I better don't answer that question. David Ferry is dead already. It is no use to be talking about a man that is dead now. They say, Mr. Pena, the HSCA has a mandate to investigate the circumstances surrounding the assassination. And I would appreciate knowing any information you have concerning relationships between Sergio Arcata Smith and David Ferry with Lee Harvey Oswald or any other knowledge you have concerning Lee Harvey Oswald. Now, let me repeat the question. Do you know whether Sergio Arcata Smith or David Ferry knew Lee Harvey Oswald? He says, I will not answer that question. I knew David Ferry and Sergio Arcata Smith was very, very close. Were either of them close with Lee Harvey Oswald? He says again, I will not answer that question. Would you give a reason why you refuse to answer these types of questions? He says, we have the same trouble I have with Brignier. Arcata Smith will come around and start suing me. Since 63, I have spent over $20,000 in attorney fees. They tell him, while David Ferry is no longer alive, did he have a relationship with Lee Harvey Oswald? Pena says, I want to tell you one thing and put that there. The day about 12 hours before William Ferry, David William Ferry died, he came to my place of business at the Habana Bar at 117 Decatur, and he was very nervous. And he asked me that it is very important, extremely important, that he see two people. One of the persons was Sergio Arcacha Smith. And to prove this, I'm going to use Carlos Brignier. I told them what I hear, that Sergio Arcacha Smith went to Texas. At that time, Carlos Brignier went by on the street on Decatur to his place of business. And I told him, look, why don't you go and ask your Mr. Mr. Brignier? He might know the whereabouts of Mr. Sergio Arcacha Smith. While David Ferry went to talk to Mr. Brignier, I called the DA, Mr. Jim Garrison, and I talked to Mr. Frank Maloche, one of the DA assistants at the time. He was a policeman, too, in the 1st District. So Frank says, do you know the two persons he wants to know? And I said, yes, I know the two persons. One of them is Mr. Sergio Arcata Smith. And I hung the phone up. Mr. Ferry came back to me again and said, do you know what Mr. Brignier said? Mr. Brignier said he don't know anything about the two persons I want to know. He said it is very, very important that I know about these two persons. I said, I don't know because I did not want to involve myself. 
Mr. David William Ferry left my place of business at 2 p.m., and I believe 12 hours later he was pronounced dead. So see if that is true or not true. Then they asked Pena, do you know Clay Shaw? Yes, sir. Did he have any relationship with Lee Harvey Oswald? And he says, the only thing I'm going to say about Mr. Shaw, he has been in my place of business. He was in my place of business, and that's it. Nothing else. I tell you nothing else. And they tell him, well, Clay Shaw's no longer alive either. Can you tell us anything more about any relationship he might have had with Lee Harvey Oswald? Yes, sir. He was in my place of business. That is all. He used to work at the trademark. Some kind of position there. Then they ask him, they drop the, the whole Shaw line of questioning, and they ask him, do you know Guy Bannister? Answer, I believe so. I believe I was assigned by Smith, Sergio Arcaccio Smith, three or four people, three or four Cubans were assigned to go and see Mr. Bannister about trying to collect money for the revolution of Cuba. I was one of the men assigned to go and talk to Mr. Bannister. Did Mr. Bannister have any relationship with Lee Harvey Oswald? Pena says, I can't say that. They ask him, did you ever see Guy Bannister talking with Lee Harvey Oswald? He says, no, I can't say that. Can you give a reason why you refuse to answer these questions? He says, I can't say that. But I can tell you that Bannister and Smith were very close. Was Bannister close with either David Ferry or Clay Shaw? <laughs> Pena again says, I can't say. Can you give a reason why you refuse to answer that question? Pena says, these people are dead already. Is your reason for not answering the question is the fact that these people are dead? And Pena says, oh, yes. They ask him, do you know or did you know William Gaudet? I don't know by the name. Maybe if I see a picture, but William Gaudet sounds familiar. I don't know why exactly. I can't answer that question one way or the other. I might know him or I might not. Can you tell me whether any of these people that we have been discussing had any connections with the Kennedy assassination or had it? Any relationship with Lee Harvey Oswald? Pena says, I would say yes. They ask him if he would care to elaborate. And he says, no, I don't. <laughs> would you care to give a reason for refusing to elaborate? And he said, if you bring the Cuban camp in New Orleans and subpoena Warren DeBreez, I will offer myself to take a lie test if Mr. DeBreeze takes one. If Mr. Hector Garcia, the one accusing, takes one, you be the judge. You be the judge who is telling the truth. Who is right and who is wrong? Bring Mr. Sergio Acosta Smith too. See how well he knew all these people, including Warren DeBreeze. How many times he met in private in his office with Warren DeBreeze, Mr. Acosta Smith, and DeBreeze. That's what I'm talking about. So, I ask him again do you, do you have any other information that you feel would be helpful in the investigation of the assassination of President Kennedy? And he says, Well, as I told you, Everything came out of the Cuban training camp in New Orleans. Would you care to elaborate on the Cuban training camp in New Orleans? Pena says, no, I don't. I can tell you how many have been dead already, been killed already. Mr. Pena, at this time, I would like to give you an opportunity to use five minutes to elaborate on any of your previous answers or to amend any of your previous answers or to discuss any issue that you have not previously discussed but which you feel are important and should be discussed. Answer. Let me put it this way. If I accuse somebody, that person can sue me through this paper. Mr. Pena, I would like to repeat that this deposition is voluntary on your part, and I would say again, uh, do you have anything further to add? Pena says, not right now. Not right now. And uh, He says, yes, in the future, if you find out about these people I told you about here and the truth of all this matter, you can call me back again and I will tell you a little bit more. Uh, the answer, you know, what matters are you specifically referring to? And he says, everything we've been talking about in this deposition. So, there you have it, folks. The sworn testimony of Orestes Pena was taken the 29th day of June, 1978 for the HSCA. Now, 
There's a lot of stuff. There's a lot of meat on that bone. There's a lot of meat on the bone. So let's pick it apart a little bit. Now we've we've all heard the allegations of the Cuban training camp or Lake Poncha training. Uh, you know, we've heard that David Ferry was training people out there. We know that Ferry and Sergio Ocasio Smith were close. You know, Pena substantiates it. You know, Pena was the one that bailed Carlos Brunier out of jail in New Orleans after they were arrested for their fight on Canal Street. We know that after Oswald was arrested, he uh, asked to speak to someone in the FBI. Now, why would that be? Why would that be? Why would they do that? Why would he do that? And they talked to Oswald for an hour and a half. We don't have any of those notes. None of that conversation is ever saved. Um, you know, what was going on here? And we have, you know, you couple this with some of the stuff that we've taken from other folks' testimony, like Thomas Beckham, you know, when he's talking about handing out, after handing out the flyers in New Orleans, um, him and Oswald went to get a Coke, and this is when Oswald supposedly told him that he was protected by the chief, you know, that the chief was pr could protect him. The chief was watching out for him. And was the chief Bannister? Was who was the chief? Was the chief Hoover? Was he talking about Hoover? Or was he talking about someone else? Um, very hard to say. But there is a lot of hanky hanky stuff going on. You know, we go to, we know Garrison was going after Sergio Alcantara Smith. There was definitely something fishy going on in the Camp Street building, the Balter building, um, and the Customs House. And here we have the eyewitness who states that he saw Lee Harvey Oswald hanging out with agents from the Customs House, intelligence agents, either the FBI or the CIA. So what the hell was going on here? Why are all these people scared to talk? We know Oswald knew David Ferry from the whole Civil Air Patrol days. We know Oswald was in and around 544 Camp Street in the Balter building. We know Bannister and Sergio Ocasio Smith had offices in the Balter building, which is right across the street from the Customs House building, which is where, you know, the FBI and, and the CIA and, and the immigration and uh, the Customs and all their headquarters were back then. So what was really really going on here. You know, we know the FBI under their COINTELPRO type stuff, and even before that, we're trying to infiltrate these subversive groups and do away with them, compromise them, compromise their members, eradicate them, fish out any commie sympathizers, any red lovers, and, and so on and so forth was was what they were doing there in New Orleans an extension of that I mean you have all these key players knowing each other okay it's not a coincidence it's definitely not a coincidence so what was going on so let's de dive a little further here and we'll get to what Anthony Summers feelings on the whole matter are you know, I've dug into Warren DeBreeze. There's not much to find out about him other than the fact that um, he denied repeatedly Peña's accusations. And the HSCA believed DeBreeze over Peña. Um, now, when Anthony Summers interviewed DeBreeze, and he also interviewed Peña, Peña gave the impression that he produced his accusation about the FBI contact to hide some different but relevant truth. But again, that's just speculation and that's just a feeling. Pena was active in anti-Castro exile politics and deeply involved with the CRC. When Carlos Brignier was arrested after the fracas with Oswald and was arrested as Pena, who secured his release. In that sense, he was well-placed to have information on Oswald's activity in New Orleans. 
In his interviews for the book, meanwhile, he insisted that he knew Oswald had been working for a government agency in the summer of 63. In 1994, the author, Anthony Summers, tracked down a former FBI informant, documented as such, who said he learned that Oswald was indeed used by the FBI in New Orleans. Joseph Burton, who at the time was running a locksmith business in Plant City, Florida, when he was interviewed by Anthony Summers, said he was employed by the FBI for two years in the early 70s to pose as a Marxist and infiltrate radical groups. He was sometimes accompanied by a woman from New Orleans, also an FBI asset. The Bureau has admitted that Burton was a valuable and reliable source and was paid for his services. A senior official confirmed to the New York Times that the woman, whose name was not revealed, performed missions abroad for the FBI. I did several trips with her, Burton told the author, and she said she and her husband, they were both working for the Bureau, knew Oswald had been connected with the FBI in the New Orleans office. Her bureau contact, she said, told her Oswald had been an informant. I talked about Oswald with the agent I usually met with in New Orleans, and he said, oh, we owned him, or something to that effect. They always use that statement if they were paying someone to cooperate with them. The totality of the information about Oswald's activity in New Orleans justifies real suspicion that Oswald was wittingly or unwittingly manipulated by a government agency. This information fits with the FBI's COINTELPRO instituted a few years earlier specifically to discredit and disable groups that were seen as subversive. <laughs> now, CIA officer John Tilton, who would go on to serve as a chief of station in Bolivia, told the FBI Sam Papich on September 16th, 1963, that the CIA was planning an operation to discredit the Fair Play for Cuba committee in a foreign country. And suddenly, mysteriously, within two weeks, Oswald arrived in Mexico City and showed his fake FPCC identification card to Cuban embassy officials who suspected that he was a CIA provocateur. And on November 22nd, 1963, on the same day Kennedy is assassinated, CIA propaganda assets in the Cuban Student Directorate, guided and monitored by George Joannides, linked Oswald to the Fair Play for Cuba Committee. And in December of 63, the Fair Play for Cuba Committee went out of existence, tainted by its connection to Oswald. <laughs> and there you have it, folks. What is the truth? The truth is this. The truth is this. The FBI and whether they say it or not, the CIA, were probably deeply interested in what the hell Oswald was doing after returning from Russia. A supposed defector who lived in Russia for two and a half years wants to return to the United States with a Russian wife who is probably a spy herself. Yeah, they're going to keep an eye on him. They're going to be interested in what he's doing. And they're definitely going to be keeping tabs on him and talking to him. Now, ask yourself again why Oswald, after he was arrested, asked to speak to someone in the FBI. To get somebody from the FBI down here to straighten this out. And Oswald was let go a little while later. Think about it. He felt protected by the chief. Oswald let that uh, Freudian slip happen on the radio where he said he was under the protection of the government of the United States government. <laughs> oops. There's an oopsie if I ever heard one. So what was Oswald up to? 
what was the, what was the federal government up to? What was the FBI up to? Did somebody drop the ball somewhere along the line? Or was the ball in play the whole time? Anyway, that's it, folks. This is another one in the can. See you in Dallas, folks. I'll be coming to you live from Dallas in the next couple days, so stay tuned. I'm going to have a whole bunch of goodies, goody good stuff coming from Dallas. Surprise interviews, surprise shows. Keep an ear to the ground. Keep reaching for the stars. Peace.